Well, today, today we're going to talk about a lot of things, one of which is going to be body parts. So I'm going to ask that the small children be removed from the services, or at least their hands put over their ears. No, it's not going to get that graphic. But we're going to start off with our childhood. Many of you, many of us, played sports when we were young. We played organized sports. If we grew up in the church, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. You didn't play much organized sports. Maybe uh, at the feast, it was a pickup game, or maybe during school, if you went to Imperial. Uh, if you were brought up as a pagan, as I was, you played a lot of sports, a lot of organized sports in football and baseball and basketball. Junior high, there was Babe Ruth, there was Pee Wee soccer, and high school and some college. Immediately you're told whether and whenever you, you uh, were on a sports organization or in one, you were told at the very outset that you are on a team. Team is everything. You win for the team. The team, you'll be reminded, is what's listed in the winnings and the losings on the board. It is a team effort. And I remember hearing more than once, you bleed for the team or you bleed alone. And that's what was drilled into you. And yet, even with all that said on a team, and as we know from sports today, you play as an individual. You had a specific, a very specific job. I was, was still am, left-handed. So I started in right field, and I went to first base, then to shortstop for one game. That was a disaster. So I went back to first base. And many of us played different positions. It doesn't matter whether you're a girl or a boy, or intramural sports, it was the same, but your part of the team was important. Your part, your individual part, was critical. If you overreached and went for that extra base or you dove for that ball and you blew it, you missed it, you were the goat. If you made it, you were the hero. So not a lot of people took chances as individuals. And that is the balancing act. Part of a team, but you play a specific part. It's much like many, many things in life. If you're in the orchestra, you play a specific part. If you learn the clarinet, you play the clarinet. You don't move over into the oboe section and play your clarinet inside the oboe section, not usually. If you're in the choir, you sing a specific part. The choir is practicing for the fall holy days and we'll be given music today and we'll be asked to sing a very specific or try and sing a very specific part. You're hopefully trained a little bit for that job. You're expected to do that, expect that job. But when you're, wherever you work, or when you work, you have a job. If you work for a large corporation, you work for that company. If you're self-employed, you work for yourself, and there's many people here that are. My prayers of empathy are with you if you are self-employed. I used to be self-employed, and I always was reminded, when you're self-employed, you have an idiot for a boss. <laughs> and you can have arguments with the boss. You will always lose, because your boss is you. When you work for a large corporation, or a school even, which can be very, very quite large, you will often be asked to do certain things as a worker. Certain tasks are given. You'll have possibly, more than likely, a job description. Now, I don't mean to, to embarrass anyone, but uh, we have a number of educators here. We have Liz Russell, who played the flute. Uh, she is, I think, still chair of mathematics, where she uh, is teaching. Liz, this year, tell you what, I want you to teach art, all right? For the next year, you're going to teach art. Uh, we have also have Drs. Hoover and Dr. Lewis, music and history, respectively. Uh, let's have Dr. Hoover teach history and Dr. Lewis teach music. I've just heard three bodies hit the floor. Let's ask Larry Darden, who's trained in law, UCG general counsel. We're going to have him, uh, do you know anything about astrophysics, Larry? I didn't think so. Neither do I. But these are all bright people. They're trained and educated and degreed in their discipline. And you know what? If you asked them to do those things that are not in their comfort zone, I guarantee you they'd study up on it and they'd give it their all. But you know what? Their heart wouldn't be in it, would it? It's not what they love to do. I would imagine those people 
just as you do, there are certain things you love to do. And you want to do those things. You enjoy doing those things. I don't think anyone really does anything they don't enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy what you do, you know what you can do? Quit and go find something you do love. Do something you do want. Let me ask you to explain, let me ask you to explain what your job is and what you do. And you probably have a pretty good description of what it was. Now you could ask me how my household works. And I would try and tell you. And then Becky would correct me. Because I don't know. Somebody else does it. I have my job at home. My wife has her job. And sometimes they cross over. And more times they don't. But each of us has a specific job. It doesn't matter whether you're 14 or 114. You have a job to do and things to do. And in fact, God has a job for you. And that's technically my SPS today. Each of us has a job to do. In fact, I think we heard it in the first message. Each of us has a job to do, but that is not the title of this message. The title of the message is the individual collective. The individual collective, and hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying and what I mean. So let's start over. Each one of us that is in this room could be someplace else. I'm, I'm never, ever going to take that for granted. You could always be somewhere else and do something else. But we do, by and large, most of us, near all of us, come here Sabbath after Sabbath because we want to. We come from different backgrounds, and yet we're called, I think most of us would feel, to be here. We all have different backgrounds. We have different cultures. We have different upbringings. We speak different languages in many cases. We were educated differently, trained, raised, whatever you may call it, all differently. No two of, no two of us are alike, not even close. You've been told a hundred times, if not by me, then by others that have stood here, that each one of you is unique and utterly, utterly different. And God wants it that way. He meant it that way. And he did so for a very, very good reason, because we are so different. But we are set and drawn together by a standard set of beliefs, and that we should never, ever forget. The Sabbath and Christ as our Savior are the elemental foundational aspects. One gives place and time and meaning, and the other has to do with salvation. There are many, many other concepts, ideas, and beliefs that we have, but we build on those too. Now, we've discussed your troubled childhood and mine. We've, we've discussed your career, so let's move some biblical application. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we will spend all of our time. This is a fascinating, fascinating section of Paul's writings. It's classic. It has been debated for centuries. And certain aspects of it are extremely controversial. I don't want to talk about the controversial parts. I want to talk about body parts. Because I think that's what this chapter is about. It has to do with specific aspects of the body. Two bodies in particular. In chapter 12, verse 1, he talks about and begins with, and with there's, there's some great structure here. And I want, as we read this, I'd like you to, whatever translation you have, it doesn't really matter. Whatever translation you have, you're going to see certain words repeated over and over again. And there's a structure literary structure to how he presents his case. And he'll end with certain words over and over and over again. And he'll say the same thing four different ways. But let's see if we can catch that, because Paul took a great deal of time in writing this letter to this very eclectic church in Corinth. Much like, I'm always reminded, much like Southern California. We said before, and I think it's appropriate, when you read First and Second Corinthians, it's almost like reading first and second Southern Californians. Very dynamic, very culturally mixed, as we'll see. Uh, it had a lot of competing factions and issues going on, and so do we here in Southern California. And so let's read verses 1 through 11. He says, verse, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away by those dumb idols. However you were led... However you were led, 
Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, these things are done and controlled by God's Spirit, these spiritual gifts. What we say and what we do, he says, are controlled by God's Spirit. Verse 4, he gets, begins to get to the meat of the section, and he describes the gifts because they are so varied. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one and for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of languages or tongues, to another the interpretation of those languages or tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each, each one individually as he wills. Now, there's a lot there. Obviously, the general impression is, is that God gives gifts, but they are very, very different. They are as varied as the people that receive them. This is by no means a complete list. One of the biggest mistakes we can make about Paul is when he lists off different gifts where he does it like almost a laundry list of activities, ideas, titles, we think it is complete. It is not complete. It cannot be complete, as we'll show. And so we will look at this when he talks about the differences, the diversities of gifts, the same spirit, the different ministries, and the diversities of activities, it's the same God. He is talking about a multitude of different gifts. It's important to understand that all these things are driven together by the same God, by the same Lord, by the same Spirit. And that's what he says in the first couple of verses, 4, 5, and 6. Some would misconstrue this as a Trinitarian uh, concept, but that's only if you are predisposed to it or preconditioned to it. So even if the gift is the same, the ministry is the same, the application is different. And the reason is people are different. I'm going to give you an example. When we talk about the gift of speaking, we will all give you two people, neither one of them are here, so it's easy to pick on them. One is Robin Weber, you know Mr. Weber very well. And also you know Mr. Mario Segley, you know him very well. We hopefully, I think, we may see him uh, during the Holy Day season. They are both ordained ministers in the church. They're what we call card-carrying ministry in the United Church of God. They both are male. They both are over 50. They both graduated from Ambassador College. But both of them, both of them are very, very different from each other. They don't look alike. They don't talk alike. They don't present alike. They don't have the same persona, we would say. They're very, very different people. And so that thing they do, that activity, that ministration, that gift that they may have, or that job that they have is expressed very, very differently. No one would ever confuse the two messages together. Mr. Segley and Mr. Weber, I've known them both for a long time, they think in completely different ways about the very same thing. And they believe pretty much the very same thing. But they express it very differently. Is that wrong? No, they're different. Very, very different. And I think that's what God is saying through Paul here. There are differences of ministries. Put the word minister. But the same Lord. There are diversities of activities. But the same God who works all in all. God brings it all together. From these very distant, very disparate, very, very unique perspectives. If you bring in other people that you know inside the church, people that you fellowship with, they may do the same activity, but they do it very, very differently. And that's not wrong either. The job is expressed through the individual who does it. And that's what Paul is going to be telling us here in the rest of this chapter. So again, people are different. Their approach, their style. And you know what? Those two men would say, indeed, 
they are bound by the same set of beliefs. They believe in the same thing, but we're very, very different in the way we approach them. And so we keep reading. In verse 7, excuse me, verse 8, he says, For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another the faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, working of miracles and prophecy and discerning of spirits. This is not an exhaustive list. It can't be. But it's all, it says, all done by God's Spirit. All of it, all these different activities. And there are many, many more, as we shall see. But they're all done through and by the same Spirit of God, or should be. He says, he says but one in the same, verse 11, but one in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he, God, the Father, wills it. God is directing all the activity. He is the one. He is the one that makes sure it all happens. There is no one else. God and God alone directs these activities with these individuals all through the same spirit. It's still God's spirit, but it's very, very different expressions. We continue. In this section, Paul goes through a very, very interesting metaphor. He uses an analogy. Now, I want you to, as we read this, I want you to remember, this is the first century uh, A.D. This is first century A.D. There was no medicine as we know it now. There was no understanding of science as we know now. I don't want you to think that the ancients had all this incredibly divine wisdom about the human body. They didn't. They had a great deal of knowledge, but not like we have today. But I want you to see how Paul uses this metaphor very, very well to describe a very interesting issue. He begins in verse, verse 12. He says, For the body is one and has many members or parts, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. Now, that is a physical analogy. He says the body, the physical body, the soma, has many, many different parts. But then he turns it at the end and says, so also is as well is Christ. Christ is therefore one body with many, many individual and unique members. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And he says this over and over and over again. Verse 13 is interesting because it does give us a vague connotation by using the words baptized into one body and made to drink could indeed be talking about two of the cardinal or very important rites that we have. So we have so few rites, R-I-T-E-S, in the church. One is baptism and the other is Passover. So it may be a vague reference there and that's how we come into the body. We are baptized and we partake of Passover. You cannot or should not be taking the Passover elements unless you are baptized. But he says in verse 14, for in fact, the body is not one single entity, but that entity is many. He says, whether Jew or Greek, slaves or free, recall this is Corinth. There was everybody there. This was not a Jewish city. I've been to, been to Corinth. How many of you have been to Corinth in Greece? Few of you have. There's two, there's two Corinths. There's the city of Corinth. I remember when we, we visited there, it was, on a, uh, it was a side trip. We went to the city of Corinth, and there were these modern buildings and taxis and uh, gyro stands, gyro stands, food, food kiosks every 15 feet. And I said, this is Corinth? This looks like LA with Greek people in it. And they said, oh, you want ancient Corinth. I said, that's different. They said, oh yes. And we went to ancient Corinth, which is ruins and the, the, like the Appian Way and, and uh, streets of stone. Fascinating. It's a tiny little city, but it's near the coast. And it was very, very cosmopolitan. They had trading from all over the world in Corinth. Everybody went to Corinth. It was a, a crossroads. And so when Paul says, 
whether Jew or Greek, that means Jew or Gentile, whether slave or free, they had slaves sitting in church. Were they freed slaves? We're not told. Were they still bound? We're not told. But they had different types of people there. And he says it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're wealthy or poor, left-handed or right-handed, tall or short, skinny or not so skinny. It doesn't matter, he's saying, because the body is not one member, but many. And so it is in the church. But you'll notice that he never uses the word church. It's never mentioned. It's called the body. When we baptize someone in this church, we do not baptize them into an organization. We baptize them into the very body, the spiritual organism known as the body of Christ or the general church. Now, now he gets back to the body body, the soma. He says, because it's one, not one member but many, he starts in verse 15 with this very interesting analogy. He says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Just because the foot says, I am not a hand, I'm not of the body. What's the answer? No. Just because he says he's not part of the body doesn't make it so. He's very much a part of the body. My hand is a part of my body. If it could talk, and I mean, we have talking hands on TV now. I was, I was thinking of this while I was writing it. We have talking hands on TV, and it just kind of floats in there. I don't know if you've seen that commercial. It's very weird. My hand is a part of my body. So is my foot. Because I am not a hand, says the foot, I'm not of the body. It's interesting why he says that. It's not that the foot wants to be independent. Is it therefore not of the body? No. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Now, let's talk about a foot, the foot and the hand for just a second. Do you know what the definition of a foot is? The foot is described as something used to find furniture at night. How many of you know what that means? How many of you have done it repeatedly? There's a few young, why are more young hands going up than the old hands? The old hands don't want to admit that they've banged their foot uh, on the coffee table or the whatever, the nightstand, getting up in the, uh, in the morning, or excuse me, in the evening when they're half asleep. The foot feels less important than the hand. The hands, you can see my hands. You can't see my feet. The hands are visible. Even in Paul's day, the hands were visible. The feet were usually not. They either had covering with sandals or the clothing they wore draped over the shoe. Hands are visible. Feet, not so much. Is he talking about body parts? Is he talking about feet and hands, ears, nose, eyes? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not the body, is therefore not the body? You can't see the ears as much as you can a person's eyes. An eye can be seen very easily. We talk about, look into my eyes. The love songs are all about, look deeply into her eyes. It doesn't say, look deeply into her feet, her ears, her nose. It's eyes. Eyes are visible. Ears, not so much. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? And he's using these body parts. I don't think so much that the foot wants to be a part. I think the foot is made to feel not a part. The ears are made to feel not a part, but it shouldn't. The hands are important, but try walking on them without your feet. Every part of our body does something different for a specific, a very specific reason. Try walking without your feet. I don't know if you've seen the commercial, you'd think I watch a lot of TV, but some of these commercials that you see are very pointed. There's one for a well-known hospital that treats children. I, 
I see a young man, very young man, uh, probably not more than five or six, he has no arms. But it shows him playing the piano with his feet. I can't play the piano with both hands. This kid can play the piano with his feet. Feet are important, especially that young man. But the feet are important in the body to us because God is not talking about feet. He's not talking about hands. He's not talking about your eyes or your ears. He's talking about what? He's talking about people. The feet are important. They're people too. The hands are important. They're people too. Just because you can see certain people at church doesn't mean they're more important. Just because people are out and open and more present than others, it doesn't mean they're more important. Certain people may be the eyes, certain people may be the hands, and certain people may be other parts of the body. And God says here through Paul, they are just as incredibly important. It says in verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And indeed, he's talking about the body, the physical body. Thank goodness, as I look around, most of you, most of you have got your hands where they're supposed to be and your head's where it's supposed to be. So God set those in order. But he's not talking about heads, hands, and feet. He's talking about people. So let's read it again with the idea of people. But now God has set the members of his body, of the body, of Christ's body, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. That reference is back uh, to verse 11, the second half. It's done just as he wills, just as he's planned, just as he's ordered, just as he's ordained. Everybody has a place. Everybody has a part. He says, verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? Now that's an interesting phrase. If they were all one member, one part, where would the body be? Let me ask you two questions as we look at these, this section. And I told you we are going to talk about body parts. It's talking about the body of Christ. Verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Here's the reverse. Here is one member saying, you know what? You're just not that important. I am. You're not. That's exactly what that says. Because eyes don't talk. Eyes cannot talk. So it's literally true. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. One member cannot ever say to another member, you know, your importance, I'm not sure what it is. It cannot be said. It should never be said. It said, but now indeed there are many members. I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet. I have no need of you. The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. It's a ludicrous, ludicrous remark. If we take it from physical parts back to the spiritual, who is the head of the body or what is the head of the body? It's Jesus Christ. By inference, and I don't mean to read into this in any way, shape, or form, I don't want to read into this, but indeed, is he saying, is Jesus Christ as the head will never say to the body, us, I have no need of you. You're not important. I'm the head. You're just the body, and I can, I can do very well without you. I can do very well without you. No. He cannot say that. Verse 22, no, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. They are very necessary. They're important. They're vital in many cases. It is important for us to remember that. It's important to say to ourselves and remind ourselves that each and every point of the body is important. We continue. Those, those members which the body seem to be weaker than necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable are those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. 
but our presentable parts, they have no need. We have different types of body parts, don't we? We have parts that you can see when, you, you know, you, I, I don't, it doesn't make me feel good that you get to look at me and you don't get to look at you, because, but you can see certain parts of me. You can't see underneath my shirt, probably a good thing, right? You can't see inside my head, a better thing. But those things that we cover up are vitally, vitally important. In uh, one of the commentaries, verse, verse 24, uh, Harold Marr in his commentary says in verse 24, by saying, by saying that God, quote, has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, Paul means that through implanting modesty and self-respect in our hearts, God has caused it to protect our unpresentable parts. They're not presentable. They're not to be displayed because they're internal to us from exploitation, and so we cover them. And that is modesty, and that was in Paul's day as well. Not so modest, I would think Paul would think of our day. The men and women were pretty well covered. It was the heat of the day, and it's the sun. But there's a certain modesty that we don't show certain parts of our bodies. We surely don't show our internal organs. There's not a glass, glass partition on any of us that we can look deep inside. And so we protect certain parts of the body. And so too, there are parts of the body in the church, in the body of Christ, that are incredibly detailed and incredibly important that we never see. They will never be seen. They're covered. Paul is saying they need to be covered. They need to be protected. And so he says, those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Every part of the body in the church or the body of Christ is critically important. And some you never see, and some you will never see. And that's okay too. He says that indeed, he says that indeed these unpresentable parts, no one wants to see your internal organs, let me tell you right now. I sure don't, but they are vital. No one in this room is walking around without both kidneys. Nobody in this room is walking around without their whole intestine or some intestine. We can remove part of it and still function, but no one has no intestine. These internal parts are vital to the functioning of the body and yet we don't see them. They're covered, they're hidden, and that's important. And so he goes on. He says, these have greater honor because they're so important. God composed the body, the rest of verse 24, but God composed the body having given great honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, no division. That's why surgery on a physical body is so traumatic. The surgery that Gordon Barr is going through, poor Gordon, poor Gordon, I mean, he is a survivor. He has had so many things happen to him. I think he's on dialysis, uh, he's, got room, he's got some arthritis, and now he's fallen and broken a hip. 100 years ago, he probably wouldn't have survived this long. So when we have surgery to repair, it's traumatic. We don't like it. Anybody that's ever been under the knife, you didn't like it. That we don't want a division inside the body. There should be no schism of the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice together. All the parts of the body are important. Paul was not trained in physiology. He was a man of the first century. He was a tent maker. He wasn't supposed to know this stuff. But you know what? You and I do. You and I have been given tremendous knowledge about the way the human body works. We know the way that neurons and syntax and synapses in our brain work together. We know about the biochemical functions to some degree of our bodies. Paul knew none of that. 
All the more reason we should understand how the inner workings, how the nerves inside of our head give us some life. They make us awake. The electrical system in our bodies is critically important. Without it, we would be dead. And we know that. All the more reason we should understand how his metaphor here is so very important. And so he says there should be no schism, but that the members should have the same care one for another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all of them rejoice. All are vital. It is important when we have a baptism, we rejoice and we do. When we have a marriage and we do, we rejoice. So these are things that we rejoice in together. Individuals are brought into the church as individuals. They become a part of the body and we rejoice. So what does this say? The church as a whole needs its parts to do its part. But there is a body part, funny enough, in this whole section that's missing. And for the churches of God, it's, it's a big miss because it's so very, very important to us. We hold it in very, very high esteem. But that's missing here. You know what it is? The mouth. He never brings up the mouth. He never brings up the tongue. He never brings up speaking. But we hold a very, very high reverence for speaking, don't we? We have, and it is important. It is vital. But Paul does not mention it. This is what he does mention. Ears that are for listening, feet that are for walking, eyes that are for seeing, hands that are for holding, a head for thinking, and a nose for smelling. Now that would be a good doctrinal study paper, wouldn't it? The nose, the importance of the nose in Paul's discourse on 1 Corinthians 12. You'll notice he doesn't say a thing about words. All those things, the smelling, the hearing, the listening, the holding, the walking, they are all actions. If you'd heard the Bible study this morning, and to a degree the first message, it is actions by which we are judged, not our talking. What you're doing says so much to me, I what? I can't hear what you're saying because your actions are so loud and they're so different from what you've said. It is action, ears, eyes, feet, hands. It's not the traditional five senses that we're familiar with, but it is indeed what we do that people remember, not so much what we say. I don't remember what he said, but I do remember what he did. I don't remember how he said it, but I remember the good things that he did or she did. The gifts that God gives us are indeed spiritual, but they are manifested in action. They're manifested and shown by the doing. Each of you, no matter what anyone has told you, has a job to do, and that job is vital. And that's what verse 24 says. He says he raises up the seemingly unhonorable to more honor, but they're unhonorable or disrespected in our eyes, not in God's eyes. Those that we don't put on such a high lofty pedestal, God does. So the problem is the perspective not of God's, but of ours. A woman once said to me, I don't have a lot of money, I suppose all I can do is just pray. Now she thought that wasn't much. What do you think about that? I had a man say once to me, I'm shy. I can't speak to a group of three or four people, let 30 or 40 or 200. I guess I can only help a little, only serve a little. So sad. Indeed, all the parts, per Paul, we should never, ever diminish the gift that we have or the duty that we feel we have because there is no duty that is too small, never unimportant. Try living, as small as it is, without your gallbladder. Talk to anybody that's had their gallbladder removed. Their life is different. Talk to someone who's had a kidney removed. The kidney is just about the size of your fist. 
as a percent of body weight, it's small. Their life has changed forever. I know many, many people who are walking around with one kidney. And so these small things are very important, per Paul. But it's the things that we cannot see in the church, the, the things that we will never see, the people that are doing things that we never will observe, who do so quietly, without any fanfare, without their name being on a bulletin, or their name being uh, put in, into a, a document to laud them. They do so quietly, silently, highly effectively. Many of us have had the honor of speaking to you, mine for far too long, <laughs> but it's often the things that we do in daily life that are important. In verses 25 and 26, in 25 and 26, he has said there are two issues, that we are all connected, that we, are no, we have no division. When one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. What does this mean? Let's talk about divisions for a minute. I believe that it is the arrogant I. It is the I, the arrogance of the I, who says, I'm more important. I'm smarter than you are. What I do means something. Schisms start with that. Beware when you hear that, especially from a speaker. But it's down in the the depths of daily work, of praying, requ prayer requests, which we had today, the announcements and weddings and baptisms, which we do and we will, that we rejoice together. Those don't cause schisms. Baptisms have never caused a schism, ever. A marriage of and by itself has never caused a schism. But the arrogant I has. The E-I-E -E equal sign the letter I. So. He goes in, in verse 27 to what we will call a transition, a sub-conclusion, a sub where he, indeed we talk about the, the topic. He says, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. There's that individual collective of a group, but individual. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Then he asks the question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And then he says, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Before passing, he asks, are all apostles? No, of course not. Are all teachers? No, of course not. You'll notice what he missed. You'll notice what he missed because this is not a laundry list. He missed pastors. Elders, local elders, preaching elders, local preaching, visiting elders. This is an inside joke. They aren't listed. They aren't listed. It was not meant to be a comprehensive list. He didn't mention those that pray without ceasing, those that give, those that give to the poor, those that visit the sick. He didn't mention any of those. Are those important? Absolutely they're important. They're all important. The body has hundreds of jobs, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs. And it's important that you realize that yours is important. Praying is important. We do it twice in a service, sometimes more. Sometimes we do it during announcements. It's important. Individual prayer to me is just, if not more, important. It says the prayers of a righteous individual, not a righteous church, availeth much. The sound that we have here, the people that control the sound, the lighting, the building, making sure that it's safe and sometimes warm, sometimes cool here. Sabbath school, choir, special music, visiting the sick, those that put, put on socials, that clean up and help prepare and put away, making everything nice for us. All those jobs are important. And sometimes, in most cases, they're gifts. Those people are good at it. And they love to do it. If they didn't love to do it, they'd go do something else. I promise you, they love to do it. And you too have a job. It may not be the job that you'll have in five years. It may be a different job that you have, a different motivation that God has given you. But the body, the body of believers has hundreds and hundreds of jobs. 
We should never ever say, I can't be an apostle. I can't be a speaker. I can't be a teacher. What am I supposed to do? There's nothing left for me. There is indeed. Watch and look and hear around you. There are plenty of things. And now he tells us what action or how and what way we are to do these jobs. And we'll conclude with the verses with this chapter. It's a very famous chapter, chapter 13. Remember, there was no chapter or verse breaks in the original. It went right on through. So he says, but earnestly desire, the last verse of 31 and 12, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. I'll give you the remainder of the Sabbath to read that chapter on your own. Because indeed, you should read it on your own. You do not need it read to you. It's important because it does speak of the individual collective. We read these things in church, we study together in church, but we go out as individuals. Services are important. This is called corporate or collective worship. When we sing or pray to one another, when we have a hymn along, we do so collectively, corporately. There's nothing wrong with that. It's important. Services are important. Hymns by the congregation are important. Prayer before and after church is important, but it is collective or group worship. In Abraham's day, there was no synagogue. For thousands of years, there was no collective worship. It was principally individual. People in their homes, the families, it was individual worship. And now we have both. Do you realize that approximately 3% of your week we spend together? You can do the math on a four to five hour time frame of a week mathematically, it's 3%. Therefore, 97% of our time is spent alone, asleep, or with other people not in a group setting. The vast majority of the time that you have will be as an individual, not as a group. You're still part of the team, you're still part of the body, but you're out there as an individual. When we are in, as an individual, out in the world, we can get confused. Sometimes we get confused that church services and church, that's life. That is our life. Church service is life. No, wrong. Life is life. The 97% is just as much a part of your life as being here. We utilize what God has given to us to live that life. 97% of the time away from each other and 3% with each other. When we live the, leave this building, though we are still a part of the body of Christ, it is you with the gifts the abilities, the knowledge, the wisdom, coupled with God's spirit, that is on display. People will not care what this body of believers thinks. You do realize, I hope, that Google has brought people to us. What they want to know is when they get on Google and they Google, which is a verb, Sabbath keeping church, our name is one of the first that pops up in this area. When they visit us, they want to see if the Google group that they read about is the group that they see. They don't want to be handed a booklet. They want to know what you think. And though even then you're in the collective, you'll be spoken to as an individual. It is important to understand the power that you have, that God has given you to do that job with that understanding. Paul says in this chapter, we're to provide these works both within the church and outside the church with love. We do not obtain salvation by works. Say it again. We do not obtain our salvation by our works. It is impossible, as good as the works may be. He says they are as dung. 
So we know it is not our works that saves us, but our good works inside and outside this building are evidence of our salvation and what we believe, and that we do put those words into practice. You've heard it all day. You heard of the Bible study, you heard it in the first message, I think you sang about it. You heard about it in announcements. You're probably gonna hear about it in the, in the closing prayer and the hymns that you sing. Let me leave you with just a few concluding thoughts of this chapter. Paul is trying to convey there is a body of believers. It has many, many different members. It has many, many different parts. And those parts, they don't look alike, they don't act alike, but they are part of the body and they believe the same thing. But they also are called upon as individuals with your personality coupled with God's spirit to work out those good works in love. So number one, you are the body of Christ. You are the body that Paul speaks about. You have a vital role to both this organization as a body of believers, not as a corporate organization, but as the body of Christ and as individual representatives of God and Jesus Christ. You need to determine, if you haven't already, what your unique gift is that you would love to do and to help serve the body. And don't let anyone ever criticize you for what you are doing. Don't let anyone tell you your job or your duty is not that important. If you think you're called to be an apostle, uh, please discuss that with uh, Mr. Helge and Mr. Fish after services. But other than that, other than that, other than that, each of us is called to do good works. So as you individually perform the specific God gift that God has given, do, given to you, do so as Paul ends this section in 1 Corinthians 13. Do it from love. And do it with a loving objective, a loving reason, and motivation. Because at the end of the day, that's how we all wish to be treated.